So in this paper, I will look at how religious networks, i.e. institutional connections that linked places, and networks of religious, i.e. connections between people, enabled literary exchange between England and the Low Countries in the Middle Ages. I shall focus in particular on Godfrey of Cambrai slash Winchester, who provides a good example of how these networks resulted in waves of influence from the Low Countries, which stimulated literature in England during the period immediately after the conquest. We know absolutely nothing of Godfrey's early life, except for the fact that he was born in Cambrai, probably sometime before 1055. We can, however, at least say something about Cambrai in Godfrey's time, which gives us an idea of the context for Godfrey's formative years. Cambrai was an Episcopal city, which derived some of its importance from its ecclesiastical role. The networks created by and around the bishop created a court life in which the production of, amongst other things, art and books was cultivated. This is important context for understanding the production, as it were, of someone like Godfrey, who traveled from the continent to England and was able to have an impact on the literary world. Our knowledge of Godfrey begins with his move to England where he joined the Benedictine community of St. Swithins in Winchester, soon after the conquest, circa 1070. He was perhaps about 10, 15 years old, meaning that a significant part of his education had already been completed during his formative years in Cambrai. He was subsequently appointed prior of St. Swithins in 1081 or 1082. Godfrey's move from Cambrai to Winchester was a significant event in the history of Latin literature in England. His move gave England its first author of Latin epigrams in the style of the Roman author Marshall. In fact, his adoption of Marshall's style was so convincing that some of his poetry circulated under Marshall's name in the Middle Ages. In some Marshall manuscripts of the 15th century, we find Godfrey's book of epigrams, though in the oldest and best manuscripts, the same epigrams do indeed appear under Godfrey's name. These misattributions to Marshall indirectly tell us something of the reception of Godfrey's poetry. But we also have direct evidence. William of Malmesbury praised Godfrey's poetry and in the preface to book two of the Polyhistor, he even promises to include some of Godfrey's epigrams, though none of the epigrams subsequently appear there. William praised the literary qualities of several of his contemporaries. Rod Thompson argued in his 1987 book on William of Malmesbury, that William's praise of Godfrey shows that William quote, saw his own time as a renaissance of correct antique Latinity. However, the supporting quotation offered by Thompson is, I think, textually defective. We therefore cannot say that Godfrey was being praised for pursuing the revival of correct antique Latinity. Here is how Thompson prints it in his 1987 work. Quid omne divinum officium, quod venustate quadam obsoletum, Nativa excultum vetustate fecit splendescere. Thompson does not translate the quotation, but as it's written, it would have to mean something like this. Liter literally, the whole divine office, which had been made obsolete by a certain beauty, having been improved by native antiquity, he made it resplendent. Even if we put it less literally, it still clearly makes no sense. He improved with native antiquity and made resplendent the divine office, which had been made obsolete by a certain beauty. What would it mean for something to be when ostate quadam obsoletum, made obsolete by a certain beauty? Thompson appears to be basing his argument on the words nativa excultum vetustate, improved by native antiquity, presumably taking this as a statement that Godfrey rewrote material in more classical Latin. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, this is one of those examples of the times when you think you've had a great insight during your research, but you quickly realize it's not as exciting as you originally thought. The textual problem I saw is all too easily solved because the next passage, because the passage is not unique to the Gesta Pontificum. A similar section also appears in the Gesta Regum. Still more, the whole divine office 
which had become a kind of rustic survival, was by his energy developed in its natural beauty and given a new brilliance. As shown by the parallel from the Gesta Regum, clearly in the Gesta Pontificum, the words when astate, beauty, and wet astate, antiquity, need to swap positions. And in fact, the words do later swap positions in Winterbottom's 2007 OMT of the Gesta Pontificum, for which the text and translation were in fact done with Thompson's assistance. So further, the whole divine office which had become outdated, he developed in its natural beauty, giving it new brilliance. The passage clearly treats Wetastate, antiquity, as a negative aspect of the divine office and something which Godfrey fixed. We therefore cannot claim that William praised Godfrey's Latin as a revival of correct antique Latinity, even though that may well have been what William thought. I should be clear on this point. I'm not saying that William didn't admire Godfrey for an ability to channel the ancient authors and write a more classical style of Latin. I'm just saying that William doesn't explicitly say anything of the sort here. In fact, in the OMT commentary for the Gesta Pontificum, Thompson and Winterbottom note that this passage and therefore the analogous passage in the Gesta Regum may not even be about writing or rewriting at all. The meaning is unclear. William seems to use divinum officium loosely to mean any service of worship. In that case, he may mean that Godfrey revived the observance of particular feasts which had fallen into desuetude. There is no evidence that Godfrey actually rewrote liturgical material. There may be people in the audience today with something to say on the most likely meaning of divinum officium here. I'd be delighted to hear any thoughts during the discussion. The problem is that we must first understand what divinum officium means before we can begin to guess what was obsolete about it, what the native beauty was, which was cultivated, and how exactly Godfrey improved the divinum officium. I should note that the context does not give us much help. William, just prior to this comment, has been praising Godfrey's literary abilities, but he then moves on to his other strengths. So the discussion of the Divinum Officium coming in the middle could either be a continuation of Godfrey's literary merits or a transition to talking about his other qualities. It is Godfrey's other qualities to which I now turn. I promised in the title of this paper to say something about places. So let's return to Winchester. At Winchester, Godfrey's contribution was not solely literary. He didn't spend his whole time writing epigrams and letters. Godfrey made a very concrete contribution to the cultivation of links abroad by improving the standard of welcome offered to visitors and setting an example that was followed by his monks. In William's day, there was a guest house at Winchester which served to welcome visitors. And this may have been Godfrey's doing, although William doesn't quite say this explicitly. This is explained in a passage following the one about the divine office. This passage also appears in both the Gesta Regum and the Gesta Pontificum. This is on the screen here, and I'll just do the translation. He made a fine beginning in raising the standard of religious life and of hospitality, leaving a pattern for his monks, who to this day follow their prior's lead in both departments to such good purpose that in little or nothing do they fall short of the highest praise. For example, there exists in that house a resting place for visitors who come by land, by sea and land, to their heart's content, in expense unfailing, in affection inexhaustible. So as a result of Godfrey's influence, the standard of hospitality was raised not only for those from England, but also for visitors from abroad, i.e. by sea. Now, it is true, of course, that terra marique by land and sea is a formulaic pair commonly used from antiquity onwards. But there is other evidence that shows that guests from across the sea were indeed welcomed to Winchester by Godfrey. For we know that while he was prior of Winchester, of St. Swithin's at Winchester, Godfrey hosted Lambert, abbot of saint Bertans, who therefore crossed the sea to visit England. The account of Lambert's visit also 
cor corroborates William's comments on the generous hospitality of Winchester under Godfrey. We are told of Lambert's stay in England and the warmth with, with which Godfrey welcomed him by the anonymous author of the Continuatio, appended to the end of the Tractatus de Moribus e Gregii Patris Lamberti Ecclesiae Sancti Bertini Abatis. Lambert was the abbot of Saint-Bertin's who was born circa 1060. He entered Saint-Bertin's circa 1070, um, and he became abbot in 1095, dying on 22nd of June in 1125. The Tractatus itself is found in two manuscripts, Oxford, an Oxford Bod Bodleian uh, Laud manuscript and saint Omer manuscript, previously um, at Saint-Bertin. The Continuatio, however, appears only in the Oxford manuscript, according to Holderego, who himself examined the saint Omer manuscript. He notes that it is unclear whether the saint Omer manuscript ever had the Continuatio. According to Holder Egger, the two manuscripts agree at least on the sections they both have on initials and punctuation. The Tractatus itself was probably written while Lambert was alive at some point between 1116 and 1119, not according to Holder Egger by a monk of saint Bertans, but rather by a discipulo extraneo, a foreign pupil of Lambert. A little later, apparently after 1118, but before the death of Lambert in 1125, some other foreigner, alter quidam extraneus, uh, who was once at saint Bertans, added some chapters in which he briefly recounted amongst other things, Lambert's journey to England. This, at least, is how Holder Egger sees it. Holder Egger argues that the author of the Continuatio was not Anglo-Norman, despite the fact that he recounts at length the trip to England, and especially the stay in Winchester. His argument is based on the beginning of the description of the English journey. Quanti nominis apud extras nationes Extiterate. Lambert was famous among, throughout foreign countries. Holder Egger is not explicit regarding his readless reasoning, but he presumably thinks that an Anglo Norman could not refer to England as one of the extras nationes, foreign countries. However, England was indeed a foreign country in relation to Lambert, regardless of where the author of the Continuatio came from. Anyone, including an Englishman, could write Lambert was famous in foreign countries like England. This therefore does not prove that the author was not from England. In fact, as noted by Holder Egger, the focus on the visit to England does make one suspect that perhaps an English author. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Van Houts has wondered whether the Continuatio was written by an eyewitness of the visit, perhaps even Lambert himself, as context for a praise poem by Godfrey, which then appears in the Continuatio. I hope I haven't misrepresented anything there. The author of the Continuatio uses England as an example of Lambert being famous abroad. Lambert was apparently sent by the Flemish consul to England. During his stay, he visited Winchester on the day of Epiphany and was fainted, fated, celebrated. We are told that he was asked to come to Winchester, but we are not directly told who made the request. Dum ergo in Anglorum Regnum Moraretor, descendit rogatus multis precibus et coatus in Orbe Wintoniensi. While he was staying in England, he went to the city of Winchester, having been asked repeatedly and pressed into going. The link with Godfrey, however, seems clear enough. Godfrey, as I have already noted, was at the time prior of St. Swithin's in Winchester, and the Continuatio gives Godfrey's love for Lambert as the reason for Lambert's generous reception. I translate here only the section in bold. In accordance with the inestimable affection with which the glorious father Godfrey of blessed memory, who then held the office of prior of Winchester, particularly and especially along with the brothers entrusted him by Christ, loved Longbear. 
six elegiac couplets are then presented without naming the author, but the attribution to Godfrey seems likely. If we compare Godfrey's <clears throat> poems in his Epigrammata Historica, then we find some identical or almost identical lines. I cannot in fact find any scholarly discussions of Godfrey's self-plagiarism in general in his works. Um, so if anyone knows of any, then please do say something in the discussion. He does of course often reuse uh, phrases within some of his epigrams. In total, four out of 12 lines in this poem are not unique. And one line, line two, clearly has an almost formulaic ending. On this slide is the poem on the left with sections in bold that are not unique to this particular poem. On the right, you will see references for the analogous lines in other poems by Godfrey in his Epigrammata Historica, abbreviated EH. Some are identical, in which case I have used an equal sign, whereas others are very similar, in which case I've given the parallel. It is interesting to note that in this praise poem for Lombert, Godfrey is just as happy to reuse material from poems praising women. So you can see that line six is from a poem on Queen Matilda, while lines 11 and 12, both from an epigram on Queen Emma. It is a shame that the content of the poem tells us nothing next to nothing about Lambert, beyond the obvious, namely that he was an abbot. The author of the Continuatio says that he has abbreviated these verses from many. This could well be true. Reginald of Canterbury wrote a poem in praise of Lambert that is 43 lines long. There is <clears throat> nothing about the genre that limits Godfrey's poem to 12 or so lines. Lambert, incidentally, replied to Reginald with a poem in praise of Reginald's poem, Malchus, written on the life of Malchus, a late, late antique Syrian saint. Again, we see how monastic connections between England and the Low Countries stimulated literary production in the form of praise poetry. I hope that a brief conclusion will suffice. People, close personal connections between individuals like Godfrey and Lambert stimulated connections between England and the Low Countries, connections which resulted in literary production in the form of praise poetry. Places, people come and go. The permanence of institutions enabled the cultivation of long-standing links between places, which made it easier for individuals subsequently to cultivate personal links. For example, John of Ypres in the 14th century was aware of the long-standing connections between Canterbury and Saint-Bertin's. He even comments that the links with Saint-Bertin's went back to St. Dunstan's time, who was the first Archbishop of Canterbury to visit Sambertans, a visit which would have taken place shortly after 960 during his journey to Rome. On Canterbury and Flan Flanders in the 10th century, there is of course the excellent article by Stephen van der Putten in Anglo-Saxon England, and the reference is on the slide there. And finally, praise. In the modern world, you might at most send a thank you text or greeting card after a visit to see a friend or relative. Some of the medieval authors I've discussed did a little better, but in the case of Godfrey's poem in praise of Lambert, I shall moderate my praise for his praise poetry because he was not moved enough to write an entirely original poem. Uh, I instead, however, I owe you all praise for patiently listening to this paper. Laos Wobis, uh, thank you very much.